Well, hello again. Uh, Keep your Bibles open as we stay in Acts 16. Please pray with me. Thank you, Father, that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Uh, Open our hearts to receive your word, uh, that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, when I was seven years old, my parents gave me an important piece of life-changing news. We were moving to the United Kingdom, uh, and we went and we lived there for about two uh, years in a quaint little village outside of London, Uh, and I knew even then it was going to be a big change for me. You know, it was going to be a new friends, um, new house, uh, new school, new accents, uh, new weather, although the last week has felt, you know, very nostalgic as I look back and Brings a tear to my eye, all the rain in England. Uh, There were many changes that, you know, were happening around me, but there were also going to be changes that kind of happened to me personally. I changed when we went. Um, Some were superficial, uh, like the fact that I picked up an English accent uh, and then immediately dropped it when I got back to Australia. Uh, Some were more permanent and long-lasting. My love for history and old buildings, my love for football, and I'm sure many other things too. Uh, and to be honest, I didn't really have a say uh, in this, this change. It was kind of forced upon me. Um, and I was pretty happy to go along with it, to be honest, um, to go with the flow. But for instance, my sister, who heard the same piece of news, uh, she responded to it very differently. Uh, it really disrupted her world. She was entering into high school, and the, the fact of trying to make new friends and leaving her old ones behind was a very daunting thing. And so I think she resented the move. Eventually, she came to love England and was very sad, um, when, she, when we left, but you see, we can have different responses to the same situation because it, it challenges uh, our, our worlds. And in today's passage, we have a message uh, that brings change, far more than, you know, moving to another country. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, there is no more life-changing, transforming message than this. And it, this gospel, it, it challenges and changes people. Uh, whether you love and accept it or hate it and reject it, um, it matters, Um, and things are never the same. And so, I guess, what sort of changes should we expect when a person responds in faith? What sort of effects should we see? What sort of effects should we see in society when Christians are faithfully proclaiming the gospel? Should we have a certain kind of conversion experience? And perhaps, and I guess maybe this is the most pertinent question, do we believe that this is a message that it really is meaningful? Do we really believe that it will have an effect at all? And so, we come into uh, Acts 16, uh, and so, catching us up to date on what's happened, we've just had the Council of Jerusalem, uh, they have declared that it's by grace that people are saved, um, God's free gift in Christ. Paul and co. uh, are continuing to establish and visit churches, Uh, they're growing in numbers, they're growing in maturity, things are going well, and Paul and the team, uh, they decide that it's time for the gospel to continue to go outwards. Uh, But strangely, as we saw in the passage, they're stopped by the Holy Spirit from entering a number of areas that, by all accounts, would seem very natural to go to. They were places close by to where they were. And we aren't told why this happens, although we do know that churches were planted there later, uh, but it seems that the priorities of God at times may not match human expectations. Uh, the Lord has His own timing and purposes and takes initiative to expand the kingdom in His way. Uh, but Paul receives uh, a vision um, which helps him understand why and what he's now to do. Uh, he receives it from a Macedonian man and realizes that God wants him to take the gospel further afield. Uh, if you've got your Bible there, pick up in verse 9. Come to Macedonia and help us. Uh, after Paul had seen this vision, we got ready to leave at once for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. We see the importance and limitations. Um, of human initiatives in mission. Uh, God calls His people to go out and to proclaim the gospel, tell people about Jesus, and where to devise our best strategies in doing this. We make our plans. Uh, we're doing that with the media mission, right? But we also understand that it's God who is ultimately in control and directs our steps, which requires humility on our part uh, and for us to remember who's in command. We don't always know how things will turn out and the timing can be surprising. Uh, I wonder if you knew that uh, until 1900, um, well, at 19, in the year 1900 AD, that only 10% uh, of Africa um, would have called themselves Christians. So about 10 million people, right? And about 70% of Christians uh, were in the European kind of heartlands. Now, a century later, just 100 years later, 
The number of African Christians uh, exploded to where some 50% of the continent claimed the faith, like 360 million people or so. Um, whereas, you know, Europe in Europe has relatively declined. Uh, and I found this fact out, and I thought I'd share it because I think it's really interesting. There are as many, we're an Anglican church, right? Uh, there are as many weekly attendees of the Anglican church in Nigeria every week as there are in the Ang Anglican church in the US, UK, and Australia combined. There you go. Yeah, it is, it is impressive, isn't it? Uh, but what I'm trying to say here, the point is that God is at the helm of our mission and He directs, um, he directs its path and He directs where its successes and failures. He knows where this is going, even if we aren't always sure. And, and the good news of Jesus must advance because people need it. Uh, that is the first and fundamental task of God's people, to make Jesus known. If you really want to change the world, um, there are plenty of ways and good things we can change the world, but if you really want to change the world in this life and the next... We need to proclaim the gospel because it's the gospel that saves people. It brings them to eternal life. So, Paul and his team, they come to Macedonia um, and we see that the gospel does not leave the place or people unchanged. Uh, now, a little bit about Philippi. It, was a, um, it had a special status as a Roman colony. It had a lot of ex-Roman soldiers. It was a very Gentile town. Uh, the fact that there wasn't even enough Jews in the city to uh, have a synagogue... Um, and they were meeting by the river, meant uh, that, you know, very few people knew about the God of Israel. And we see how different people and, and different groups of people respond to the gospel um, and to Paul and his team in this, uh, in this chapter. First, we have Lydia. Uh, so, it appears the team has early success with Lydia. She's the first convert in Europe, and she, we are told, she's a seller of purple linen, uh, which means that, it, that she is a woman who has a lot of means. She makes a lot of money through this, uh, Purple linen uh, is an expensive luxury. And she, we are told, is she's a God-fearer, um, and she believed in the Old Testament God, but wasn't her Jew herself. And she hears the gospel and believes that, you know, that Christ is the Messiah. Uh, what we have described here is a very, um, a very kind of tidy salvation. It's quite, it's quite almost boring, really, in one sense. But let me tell you why it's not boring and why it's uh, really important. Uh, for instance, for Paul to consider a small group of women worth preaching to, uh, that would have been seen by Jews and Gentiles as a radical thing to do. Uh, they would not have viewed uh, such a group as being consequential enough to go and teach. Uh, we see that the gospel, it doesn't just save people, it also has uh, byproducts and side effects. Um, we see that it actually, in what Paul was doing, uh, he, and in the gospel, we see that it changes um, how women were to be seen in society, uh, not as those who have a lesser status, but equal image bearers, and for those uh, who believe, co-heirs with Christ. And secondly, we see that Paul actually, uh, God does some incredible things in Lydia. Um, she uses her means to basically support the church. We see in verse 40, she hosts uh, the church. Um, God uses her in a very powerful way. Then we see uh, there are challenges that come. Uh, further on in Acts, we see that with this growth, there comes opposition. And first, we have the challenge of spiritual powers. Uh, after the conversion of Lydia, uh, Paul and the team, they're continuing their work and they get hounded by um, this demon-possessed girl who shouts, uh, these are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now, while in other parts of the world, possessed people were to kind of be shunned in the kind of the Greco-Roman towns like Philippi, uh, oracles could be viewed as being... Um, useful as being giving guidance like fortune tellers uh, and it seems that she made her owners uh, quite a lot of money doing this and we think about the condition of this poor girl uh, she is enslaved she has no agency uh, she's been enslaved physically and spiritually and unfortunately throughout history uh, superstition and religion have been used often as a, a way of exploiting people uh, sometimes even wearing the mask of christianity uh, the science fiction author l ron hubbard uh, is reported to have said, you don't get rich writing science fiction. If you want to get rich, you start a religion. Now, you may know that's exactly what L. Ron Hubbard did. Um, he is the founder uh, of Scientology, um, which is notorious, for maybe you've guessed it, for taking people's money. So, why on earth, as we come back to this passage, why on earth is this oracle helping Paul? Well, I want to say that she actually isn't uh, helping. It seems that Maybe what a demon is trying to do is to throw the message into confusion. Uh, remember, this is a Gentile town, and when many Gentiles hear, hear the words, um, the God Most High, they wouldn't necessarily think of the God of Israel. They might 
confuse it with their own gods like Zeus. Or secondly, maybe she is hoping to piggyback on Paul's message and use it to legitimize, um, you know, the oracle business. And so the gospel would now be associated with fortune telling and the occult. Either way, it's to distract and hinder people from coming to the truth. Uh, it's not a good thing. And it becomes a big enough of a problem uh, that Paul casts out the demon uh, in Jesus' name. And this girl, she is freed. Um, she is delivered from the clutches uh, of evil. She had no agency, um, but we see that Paul delivers her. And I guess, again, looking at the byproducts of the gospel, we see the, Christ- the effect that Christian faith has had on, on cultures and societies. Uh, why did slavery disappear in the Roman Empire? Well, the answer is mainly because the Christians got rid of it. Um, it's not the gospel getting rid of slavery, but when you understand the gospel and what it means and the flow and effects, uh, you see that you actually can't uh, exploit people in that way. And so slavery could no longer continue. And her owners, um, you, know, they, they see, you know, they see and realise that this has happened. As the spirit flies off, they've lost their source of income. Um, they don't care about her, they just care about their money. Uh, and I imagine they were pretty shocked by this, like, Paul, weren't we, you know, helping you by giving you more attention? But the gospel is not about exploiting people, uh, it's about liberating them. It's not about what you can do for God, but about what He has done for you. And we see that the gospel here brushes up against some of the interests of this world. Um, I mean, of course, it should, it's a message that we are, we are sinners and that we need a saviour. Uh, It challenges us on our sinful practices and behaviours that we need saving. And so, uh, I guess there are two options when, you know, the light is shined um, on on you and, we you know, our our flaws are revealed. Either we can step into the light and repent um, and turn away from them or I guess we can go back into the darkness and hide. And I suppose that's what um, these guys do. They seek to, um, you know, double down and get revenge on Paul for what he has done because he's challenged their interests. Uh, I was reading about this American guy called Ralph Nader, uh, and he lobbied to make uh, cars safer in America. Uh, What he did was he exposed a lot of the the car faults um, that some of the American corporations had made. Uh, Now, they did not like this at all, the American automobile companies, and they actually um, got up to all kind of shenanigans to discredit Nader. Uh, They they tailed him with uh, private eyes and people harassed him in the streets. Uh, They, you know, they listened to his phone calls, uh, and... This is really childish. I don't know why I find it funny. They made obnoxious prank calls to him to annoy him. Like, I don't know why, any, but anyway, there you go. But we see the, these owners, they bring Paul and Silas before the civil authorities, um, and they're doing this out of revenge, but they kind of hide it behind, um, you know, prejudice that will win over the crowds. Uh, our Roman customs are being broken by these subversive Jews. The irony of all this is they were actually breaking Roman custom by not giving Paul and Silas, who were Roman citizens, a trial. And yet, the injustice goes ahead anyway. They're arrested and they're they're beaten severely and imprisoned. And I guess as Christians, we should not be surprised uh, that when we are faithful, uh, that when we stick our necks out, there will come opposition, um, perhaps even, you know, often unfairly. Um, Christians in the early church had to argue that they uh, they weren't, you know, traitors of Rome, they weren't seditious when they refused to burn incense to the emperor because they couldn't worship him. Or even today, when we advocate, um, I guess, a, a biblical view of, uh, of humanity and of sexuality, uh, you'll see the term, you know, thrown at Christians, where you are, you are in fact bigots, you are hateful people. And I guess when we experience heat for being Christians, I, the temptation is for us to shrink back and to make ourselves small. Paul and Silas could have done that, but they didn't. Uh, we see that they saw another opportunity to witness. Their response was one of, of prayer and joy as they, you know, uh, imprisoned, having been beaten and sitting in the stocks. We see that they, they sing psalms and hymns. They have hope. Uh, maybe one of the psalms they sung was Psalm 63. Uh, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Uh, the love of God is a very precious thing. To know Him is a very precious thing. Uh, and I guess the suffering and the opposition makes its value shine all the clearer. And so when hardship does come our way, when we are faithful, we should not be shrink back, uh, but be as bold as ever. And then we have this earthquake, uh, which at first we might think is a chance for the Paul and the prisoners to escape. Well, it's not a great escape, but it's a great witness. Uh, Paul and Silas, they remain in the cell and the jailer wakes up, thinks the prisoners have gone and he thinks he's a dead man, right? 
And so to preserve, preserve his, you know, shred of honour in the old Roman way, he seeks to, you know, impale himself with a sword. I mean, what a world of despair this, this guy lives in. He has no genuine hope. I mean, the, the best thing he hope, can hope for is a, um, a swift death. And God brings him to the end of himself to realise that when he has nothing, he might see that God is everything, because Paul steps in and saves the jailer, both from an unnecessary physical death and from spiritual death. And the desperate jailer falls before Paul and asks him that important question, which Steve, um, yeah, reminded of us last week, what must I do to be saved? Uh, it's unsure whether the jailer fully knew the, you know, the implications of what he was asking for, but he knew that he needed um, some kind of salvation and this guy, Paul, um, could give it. And we see Paul's response in verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Nothing could be more simple and nothing could be more good. We see the joy of this man, he's come from the precipice of death to suddenly having salvation and the hope of eternal life. I mean, what a change. Uh, he's so overjoyed, he goes and shares it with his family. But in, some, in a real way, that the experience of the jailer is our experience, it's our reality, right? We've been moved from death, we're removed from having nothing except expecting sin and judgment t- to life, to being adopted as God's children. I wonder if we, I wonder if you know the hope that you have, have in Christ. And so, with all this, Paul and Silas, we see they go back to their cell. Uh, I might think it's kind of odd, but they do this, and Paul um, uh, hears from the, the magistrates that they want to release him quietly, and Paul is having none of that. Verse 37, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us in prison, and now they want to get rid of us quick, quietly, No, let them come and escort us out. Uh, The magistrates hear this and realise they have made a uh, a big error, a big boo-boo, because punishing a Roman citizen unfairly uh, can have massive legal consequences for them. So, with their tails between their legs, they come out and they personally escort the disciples, which is an admission that they were wrong and that Paul and Silas were innocent. Now, this is a very kind of bit of a happy ending, right, to the experience, Uh, you know, the good guys win in the end, but we know that life isn't always like that, Uh, and in this life, God's people don't always get the upper hand. Um, Sometimes we just get the stick, but we we know that one day God will win, and then people, and His people will be vindicated. Now, coming back to Paul, why does he do this? Why does he uh, assert his rights? It doesn't seem like that normal kind of Paul thing to do. Uh, Paul isn't doing this for himself, but he cares about the reputation of the gospel, uh, he doesn't want to give people any reason to unnecessarily reject uh, the faith. And I guess the question for you is, are you willing to defend the reputation of the gospel? Um, you know, when p- if people are trashing Christians uh, in conversation, are you willing to speak up, um, even if that resolves, uh, results in a bit of a blowback? So, as we come to the end of this, I want to quickly look at uh, and compare Lydia, who saved at the start, and the jailer, um, who's saved at the end, uh, and, and think about their conversion experiences, which are quite personal. Um, we see that they're two very different people, don't we? Uh, Lydia, who already knows a lot about um, God, it seems, um, who's, who's wealthy, uh, who has a pretty, you know, easy conversion experience in one sense. Uh, and on the other hand, this, this jailer, who uh, certainly uh, would have been a Gentile uh, and an enemy uh, of the faith, uh, and who knows nothing. And yet, they both hear the gospel, um, and we see how similar they are. We, we see that different people, they have the same need. They have the same great God who saves people through Christ. Uh, and that's true for any Christian. And so, we look at this pattern of salvation, and first, we see the need for grace. Uh, we see that, like in the rest of Acts, uh, people being saved is only made possible by God's grace working in a person. If you have a look at verse 14, it says, "...the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message." Only God's saving grace, His powerful work of regeneration, can heal our sinful nature that we would believe the message. Which means that without God's grace, we can do nothing to save people. Uh, You or I, we can't change a person's spiritual condition. Paul could not change a person's spiritual condition, no matter how, um, you know, charismatic he was. But on the other hand, we see by God's grace, nobody is beyond His reach, even enemies of the gospel, like the prisoner, uh, sorry, like the jailer. And God's grace, uh, it doesn't just come down like, you know, in 
beams of light, God works by His grace through His Word, so we need to share it. Um, Obviously, we want to be persuasive, we want to have good reasons that people should believe, but it's very liberating to know that our task uh, is not to be the most convincing, charismatic person alive, but to just share the truth. And who knows what God will do in people when they hear it. Secondly, we see uh, the importance of faith in Jesus. It sounds almost redundant saying that, but that is where it's all leading, right? Do you trust in Jesus for your salvation? Do you call Him Saviour and Lord? I mean, that is what matters. That's the only question that matters. Uh, And this is true whether you had knowledge of the faith like Lydia or the jailer who knew nothing about Jesus and got a Christianity 101 course in verse 32. See, to believe and to have faith, it's not only to believe that, um, you know, it is true and that Jesus is real, it's not even to believe that Jesus is good, good, but it's to trust that He is real, that He is good and that um, what He has done is yours and it's for you. And the experience of conversion, as we've seen, can be very different. Um, but its destination is ultimately the same. And I think this tells us something about uh, our testimonies. Uh, I remember when I first became a Christian, uh, I heard about other people's stories of becoming Christians, and I always was drawn to the ones that, you know, had the kind of, it was almost like an action film, right? There was drama, there was plot twists, there was a moment of crying tears, and, you know, life being given over to Christ. Um, I'm not saying that's bad or wrong, Uh, but, but when I looked at my kind of testimony, which was some people told me about Jesus, and I don't actually remember the moment, it was kind of like a light dimmer being turned on, I'm like, oh, I'm Christian now. You know, I looked at that and I was like, huh, um, why couldn't I have an experience like that? But that is actually, um, that's wrong, uh, because we, we all have unique experiences of coming to faith, and it's always the same grace of God that works in each of us. So, you know, so God bless you if you have um, a boring testimony, because it is not boring, uh, because it is a sign of what Jesus has done for you. There are no boring testimonies. And, and secondly, the other thing is that, it, I just want to add that, it's not just that moment of, you know, of breaking down and converting. Um, faith is a lifelong thing. It's a commitment. So we see faith is there. And we also see, uh, we might notice that they, the, the, those who believe get baptised. Uh, now, this the sign of baptism is given to us by Jesus. Uh, it's the sign of the new covenant, uh, the symbol that we've been washed by His blood and died to sin. Uh, it's not a magic ritual um, that saves us, but it points to that spiritual reality. Uh, and it's for our encouragement. It's for every Christian. So, I guess my encouragement for you is if you are a Christian and you haven't been baptised as an infant uh, or as an adult, or as an adult yet, might I encourage you to do so. It's not as a, like a box you can tick off, but it's actually given to you um, by God Uh, for your assurance. It's a good gift. Now, we see that for Lydia and the jailer, their their faith doesn't just stop at belief, it bears fruit. We see their joy flows onto them wanting wanting others to know about Jesus, right? They they go, both in both cases, they go and they tell their families. Uh, And in that time, what you did was you followed, um, you know, the kind of the, the household religion of your family, Now, that doesn't lessen individual responsibility for salvation. We see in verse 32 um, that you have to believe, right? It's the message, and that's why the message is explained. Uh, But perhaps a more obvious uh, obvious thing to kind of reflect on is that Lydia and the jailer, they take responsibility for their families. They want those they live with to love and to know the Lord. And I think we have an obligation to everyone for them to know the gospel, but it's a particular obligation with those who are in our households. Um, whoever we live with, you know, if you live with your parents, if you live with, you know, housemates, uh, we want to hold out the hope of salvation uh, to invite people to share in that, or if they're already Christians, we want to encourage them in their faith. Now, this can be a hard topic because it doesn't always go as smoothly as we see here in Acts, does it? Uh, because people deny Christ, uh, we may have members of our family who don't yet believe. Um, so, I guess the question is, who can you be praying for Uh, in your family and who can you be reaching out to or or who if you live with who can you be encouraging in the faith and finally we see that in Lydia and um, the jailer that their faith results in love uh, and particularly in hospitality Uh, Lydia gives out her generosity uh, she gives the church a place to meet Uh, the jailer uh, equally he gives what he can he tends and washes their wounds and I think we see here that um, Hospitality, it's not about how much you can give, but it's about what you're willing to use to love and serve others. Uh, Paul's, uh, you know, perfect night out probably didn't include having, you know, his captor, you know, wash his back, right? Um, After he'd been, you know, beaten that day. But it's how can I practically use what God has given me to love and serve and encourage others? 
So I guess that, that question is for us. How can we show love to others, particularly in hospitality? Um, you don't have to have the perfect house or invite people over. You can just go and grab a coffee. Uh, and particularly, I think we're called to do this with other Christians, to meet up with them, to share with them, uh, to engage with them. So, wrapping up. When the gospel comes, uh, people's lives are never quite the same. It is a life-changing, transforming message. It changes and challenges people. It opens the door to eternal life. And along the way, I think as we've seen, it affects the world in unexpected and wonderful ways. I guess, do we, do we trust it is a message that will do so? Uh, that it is the message that people really need to hear so that they might be saved. Uh, are you willing to put yourself into uh, the gospel work, not necessarily knowing how people will respond um, or the changes that it will bring, but knowing um, that it is good for them? And I guess, as we look to all of this, we look to the forward to the one day uh, when that message uh, is, is not just a message, but it, it indeed comes to fulfillment uh, as Christ returns uh, and we see uh, that salvation come in full. So why don't I pray um, for what we've heard. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that your word to us is good. Uh, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Uh, we thank you that uh, through him we can have salvation, that we can have eternal life by what he has done. And Lord, we thank you that this is a message uh, that is for the world. It's for people to hear, to come and to be saved. Uh, we pray that uh, you might help us to think about how we can be doing that in our own context. Uh, please help us to do that when we find it um, difficult, when we might be wanting to shy away from speaking the truth um, of your word to others. Uh, and Lord, we, we just pray that you continue to, to work in us and transform us. Um, give us that desire to share with others. Give us that desire um, to be, yeah, to love uh, and to want to love and to care for our fellow believers in Christ. And we pray that your message would continue to go out uh, and continue to bring people into your kingdom. Amen.